I love that deep field view. It's awesome. Good to meet you, John. Sorry, I didn't introduce myself earlier. Yeah, no worries. Years. That's our chief mate, Cameron Gillis. Good. He takes How us deep do? every episode. He's yeah. the brains on the show. No, no, no. I'm becoming no, compared uh, compared to me. You are. I'm learning stuff as we go, so this it's fun. I really look forward to your talk, uh, John. Yeah, I love the, uh, the basically this gravitational lensing effect. Yeah. You know, seeing all the stretching of the cow is this amazing. I mean, and it's right there. Yep. In plain sight of the Hubble. <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine when the James Webb goes out there? What kind of uh, lensing they're going to see in other areas? Yeah, well, it's going to be very different because that's an infrared infra, uh, inter, infrared telescope. But I think oh, that you'll we'll see some amazing images. Yes. Yes. Yeah, Cameron, um, you. I think you missed there at the very beginning, but John actually um, built a lot of the testing equipment that the James Webb used. No, oh, without, wow. without his equipment, there would be no James Webb. Oh, I just stumbled. On, that's all. That's awesome. Wow, it's an honor. To, thanks, uh, John. It's an uh, honor to speak to you. Yeah, it's fun stuff. So we're just letting people kind of get settled in. Um, we have people signing on right now. And... Uh, I'm sharing um, the program on special groups on Facebook. John, are you going to be speaking a little bit about your um, work on James Webb? Well, we're going to talk mostly about this uh, new telescope, this half meter telescope I'm working on sending to Chile. So we won't talk too much about James Webb. I can do that at another time if you want to know about that. But it's more, that's a little bit more technical optical testing stuff that's maybe cool. not as of such general interest. Yep. No, that, that's, that makes sense. I just we are that, going to mention it. We That's are going to mention it. Very good. Well, everyone, this is Scott Roberts from Explore Scientific and the Explore Alliance, and uh, we are here together with uh, our special guest, John B. Hayes. Um, of course, we have Ross Ferguson and Cameron Gillis with us as well. And you're watching the 11th episode of Focus on Astrophotography. Um, it's uh, really exciting to have you here, Mr. Hayes, and uh, uh, we're really honored. So I'm gonna turn this over to Ross and Cameron, and uh, uh, I'm gonna sit back and uh, listen to uh, what, what, uh, what you have to say, John. Great. Well, we thank you, Captain Roberts. We are certainly honored to have uh, to have the guest on today. And but I, 
I do just have to tell the passengers, um, I, I am kind of scared. I, this weekend, I climbed to the top of the ship's mast. I had to put up a new sail. And you might be thinking, great, we're going to get more aperture. We're going to be catching more photons. But uh, when I was high up on that mast, I broke the first rule of the mothership. And which is, you know, you don't talk about the, no, that's, that's not it. That's, that's from Fight Club. Um, say you don't look down. Say you don't look down. And, and I did. And oh, I'm I just, I'm not ready to go back, but I know where we're going. I know where we're going. And I can't tell anybody because if, if I did, well, the, the captain, the captain agrees. No one else would board the ship. There would be a mutiny. And we just, we just can't have that. Um, so I was, I was really scared. And then I heard Ty Virtus. It's just in my ear. He started singing, living in the big blue world with my head up in outer space. I know we'll be a -O -A -O -K. I know we'll be a -O -A -O -K. So passengers, we will be a -O -K because we have Mr. John B. Hayes, the man who helped this mothership take off, the double digit patented high flying pilot who is without a doubt the greatest optical engineer alive, and a man who eh, might be responsible for that James Webb at least testing it, not the delays, certainly not the delays, but a man who knows that in the Atacama Desert, few things taste better than lemonade. So Mr. John Hayes, welcome aboard the mothership. It is now in your control, sir. Thank you, Ross. Uh, I wanna thank you guys for inviting me to talk here. Um, and let's see if I can share my screen here. Uh, let me see here. We're going to uh, switch over, and I am going to tell you about my. Um, we're going to talk today about my efforts to get a, a, a twenty-inch telescope set up and configured and sent down to uh, Chile. Uh, this is going to be a little bit more of an informal talk. I've given a few of these talks where I talk about in, in gory detail some of the technical aspects behind this telescope, but today we're just going to go over the kinds of things that are important for making something like this work. And this is a picture of the scope, uh, kind of the way it looks in my shop right at the moment. Uh, I posed it a little bit, but uh, it looks pretty much just like that. And I'll tell you why it looks that way in just a minute here. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit, start out talking a little bit about remote imaging and what that's about. Uh, you know, not everybody's lucky enough to get to be able to do this. And uh, I used my C-14 for many years uh, out, um, outside here in Oregon. I call it the uh, fly-by-night observatory because I use the, uh, uh, the region around the local Bend Airport, which is out in a pretty dark place. Um, and I put my telescope, used to put it out on a, on a taxiway where I could look at the sky and get some really nice images out here. The seeing in central Oregon is actually pretty good. Uh, it can be, but I went through a year where I couldn't image for about eight months due to clouds. And that's very unusual in central Oregon. It's normally pretty clear here, <coughs> excuse me. But I finally gave up and I stuck this telescope uh, over in, um, uh, in New Mexico out at Deep Sky West. And this is my 14 inch sitting out there. It's wrapped in Reflectex. It sits on a, on a, uh, 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 astrophysics 1600 mount and all the imaging packages on the end of there and it's bolted to the ground. So it's in a pretty dark place. Uh, and I began to realize that I really liked this business of imaging remotely because I didn't have to stay up all night. <laughs> I could right. walk in and start it just like I was sitting next to it. And I could run it uh, all night long and get plenty of sleep and do my normal daytime activities and then just sign on to the Google Drive and download the data. And it's just magical. I really loved it. This particular observatory has about 25, tele 20, 25 telescopes in each building. They have two buildings now. They supply power, network, weather reporting, video monitoring, roof control, all that stuff. They've got lots of different folks here. There's private indiv individuals, government research organizations. These guys, I don't know if you, I, hopefully you can see my mouse there. These guys over, uh, running this this little C, I think it's C11. Uh, they actually are a bunch of guys. We call them the Spooks. They're they're looking for new sat new satellites launched by China and the Soviet Union, and they do that all the time out at DSW. So there are all kinds of people doing different things at these things at these observatories. I decided I wanted a bigger telescope. I love big telescopes, and ever since I was a little kid, when I got into this, I wanted a bigger telescope. 
I really wanted a 24 inch telescope, but after looking at the price, uh, which is kind of sobering, I said, well, you know, maybe I ought to scale that back just a little bit. I wanted at least twice the aperture of the 14 inch. I didn't want to get something just a little bit bigger. So a 17 inch wasn't a big enough jump. And so the 20 inch was the smallest jump that I could make. And uh, in my more technical talks, I go through a lot of the reasons why this telescope is a, is a leap over what I currently use with the 14, but we won't go through all the math and all that stuff today. I'll just say, this is what I picked. And when you buy one of these things, this is what it looks like. You, you, know, you buy the, the, the telescope and it's on the mount and that mount is designed to bolt onto something and that's the way it arrives. And so when I first got this thing, I stood there looking at all these crates and thought, my gosh, how am I gonna test this thing? Uh, Chile is about 7,000 nautical miles from where I live. Now you may wonder why I use nautical miles. I use nautical miles because I'm a pilot and that's, that's the way we think. <laughs> so it's, it, leave it to say, leave, it's enough to say it's very, very far away. So shipping this thing off to, off to Chile without testing, it seemed like a really bad idea. So, and a lot of people do that. It's very common to, for plane wave to take an order and ship it directly to Chile to be installed. And, you know, Murphy is very clever. I like to say, you know, the idea that you hope it will work is really not a very good strategy, particularly if you're an engineer. And so I couldn't do that. So I had to figure out how do I know this thing is good enough to, to, to send down to Chile? Well, the first thing I did is I talked to the folks at Plainweb and they were very gracious. They get worried about guys like me because I said, I wanna test this thing before you, before I take delivery of it. And they're very worried that I'm going to come in or a guy like me might come in and say, this is no good. And then chase them ragged. And I said, I'm not going to do that. I understand what makes a good telescope and what doesn't make a good telescope. And this telescope was not perfect, but it passed my specification. No telescope is perfect. I should emphasize that. So this was a test with something called a phase cam. And uh, this is uh, an instrument that was made by a, a company that I co-founded and that I ran for, for about five years. And it is a very high speed interferometer that's insensitive to, to mechanical vibration. And it's the exact same system uh, and technology that, is, that was used to test the James Webb uh, telescope components. Nice. And in fact, James Webb was almost all of the components were tested with this kind of a technology. And what makes it special is we can get rid of air turbulence, we can get rid of, well, we can average out the effects of air turbulence, and we can set up something just on a floor and a mount and a, a, a mirror suspended above this and make a test. <clears throat> and I was able to test this thing and it, it met my specification of having a stroll greater than 0.8. The wavefront wasn't quite as smooth as I would like, but it was okay. Their biggest problem is on the edge. But none of this is a really big problem. I said, that's fine. This will work fine for my application. And so, you know, one of the underlying messages here, you know, when you send something to a remote observatory, you want to make sure that it's right. And I, I talked to a number of folks behind the scenes who've got problems with their telescopes. And one of those poor guys is down in Chile and he had had his scope shipped down to Chile. And then he spent a year scratching his head, wondering why he couldn't get sharp images. And ultimately, he had to trade out his telescope and he talked to Planewave about the optical quality. And it took him forever to straighten this out. In the meantime, he's paying rent and he's, you know, trying to use his telescope and he just tore his hair out. And that all resulted from just shipping it to, to Chile without testing it. So this telescope I'm sending optically is quite good. The next question was, what am I going to do about actually mounting this thing? As I said, this thing shows up with just the mount and the telescope. And the whole thing weighs, gosh, it weighs probably oh, four and a half, four and a, 450 to 500 pounds just in equipment all by itself. Um, it's not something that you can easily uh, just go set up and use. So I had to, I stood there looking at these crates and you can see some of the crates, the remains of the crates sitting there up against the wall behind this thing, thinking to myself, now what do I do? So <laughs> I sat down and I pulled out, you know, my CAD program and I designed a base. I ordered up all the materials and went to work building my own base and put it on, uh, put it on uh, some, some wheels. And I mean, this is what I did professionally for years and years. So this wasn't very scary, but it was a lot of work. This was a whole summer. This was three months of, of me building this thing. 
And it involved, you know, some uncertainty. I didn't know if it was going to really work, if it was going to be solid enough. It turned out it, it worked. It is beautiful, like John. It's yes. beautiful. Thank you. It worked like gangbusters. I mean, this thing was just incredibly good. But again, you know, you put together something new. You don't really know if it's how it's going to work. This electronics box, I'll just mention, you know, is something you want to, before you ship something off to Chile, you want to know how are you going to control it? And having had experience down in, uh, in at Deep Sky West, I, I kind of understood that the idea of taking all your power supplies and your control system and your PC and throwing it on the floor, having a rat's nest of wires and thinking it's going to work. You know, I had mice chew through my cables down in, in uh, Deep Sky West. I've had uh, gosh, a million problems, things failing, all kinds of stuff. So the biggest thing you worry about is reliability. And I'm not going to go through it. Don't, I'm not going to scare you guys and try and go through all this. It's not very hard. I mean, this, there are two things that make a remote telescope possible. The first is remote desktop of some kind. I happen to use Chrome, but some kind of, of remote des desktop application to see your computer as if you're sitting next to it. And the second thing is this one little thing down here called an IP power switch, which allows you to remotely turn things on and off. And, and once you do that, you can run it like you're sitting next to it. Um, I got this thing all put together and I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm compressing, gosh, almost probably eight, nine months worth of work into, you know, that <laughs> into this slide. It's like zoom, all of a sudden I'm here to get an image. And I rolled this out. And of course, I didn't know how well the base would work and how well any of this would work. I hooked it up, plugged it in, turned it on and got it aligned. And by golly, I, it would guide unguided for six minutes. No problem. I did. It probably would go for 20 minutes. I didn't I just didn't try it. Uh, I just let her rip for six minutes and took a bunch of exposures. And I immediately noticed two things. I mean, well, three things. I mean, first of all, I had nice round stars. That was good news. Um, but I noticed two things that bothered me. First, I had pretty dark corners. And mm. that's kind of a concern. And second, I noticed on these stars, I had a funny diffraction pattern. I had the normal diffraction pattern that I see in the middle. But as you get toward the edge, you begin to see these diffraction patterns at 45 degrees. Now, oddly enough, I think I'm the first person who ever really figured this out. I, it's a little hard for me to believe because plane wave has sold hundreds and hundreds of these telescopes. And, and I have heard from so many people when I explained what this was saying, oh my gosh, I wondered what that was. I have a hard time believing. I think somebody must have noticed it, but maybe I'm the first guy to mention it. So I, the first thing was easy. I just said, well, what's going on here? You know, what causes this? Well, it's always got to be a straight line. Anytime you see a diffraction pattern like this, there's got to be a straight line there. And I started looking at this shroud. And we use, by the way, we use these shrouds in, in remote observatories, not because of stray light. Stray light isn't a problem out in the middle of nowhere. What really is a problem is dirt and dust, because mm -hmm. this telescope sits out in the middle of nowhere forever. OK, basically forever. There's no cover on it. There's no nothing. And dirt accumulates over time. And so we put these covers on mainly to keep dirt out of the thing. So this cover, it turns out this truss structure is such that, and here's, you can see I pulled the cover back and you can see what happens. The, 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 the dust cover gets pulled flat here. And if you go off axis and look backwards down the system, it's cutting into the optical beam. Uh -huh. And that's what's causing this vignetting. That's what's causing, it's, it's vignetting. And that's what's causing that diffraction pattern. So I just did the simple sort of, you know, brute force and ignorance thing. And I just went in and I designed a 3D little 3D structure to, to clip to wire tie to the stru stru uh, truss structure. And that just holds the shroud out of the beam. And that fixes the problem. Bingo, it's all gone. And again, I, I can't believe I'm the first guy to notice this. But the guys at Plane Wave said, oh, that's a very good idea. And and I can't tell you how many guys have contacted me to say, oh, I wondered what that was. So, so there it is. That was a very nice simple work. Catch. Nice work. The second John, thing. I, I have a question, though. How, yeah. does the, how does the shroud create a diffraction spike? Well, so if I come back up here. So what's happening? And I didn't. I know, it's, I know it's coming in. I can see that it's cutting off the. Yeah. That so would if, cause vignetting. But think of it this way. If we were to put tape across this this mirror to create four to create a square mirror, yeah, just think about that a square mirror. You would get very strong spikes from that square mirror. So anytime there is anything straight in the in the pupil, 
Okay, I whether it's on axis or off axis, light mm -hmm. will diffract to form a diffracted edge. And so when this edge intercepts that, that's what's forming this spike. Now you notice the spike's stronger on one side than the other. Yes. <clears throat> that's because you're only intercepting one edge of the marginal ray there off axis. Okay. And so if you were to look, go back up to this, this image and kind of hunt around here and you don't, you'll see that the strongest is always toward the inside. Mm -hmm. You'll see that. And so that's because of the way the, the this shroud is intercepting the off axis rays. Got it. But anytime okay. you see a diffraction spike, that's a nice line like that. That means you've got a straight edge somewhere in there that's at right angles to that spike. Got it. Interesting. Very cool physics. Okay. <clears throat> Next is flat calibration. Now you guys, I'm assuming all you guys are astrophotographers. And if you're an astrophotographer with any experience at all, you know you've got to use flat correction to get rid of a, a bunch of things. I mean, number one, we get rid of um, <clears throat> any kind of vignetting. We get rid of cosine to the fourth fall off. And the really important one that most people forget about is PRNU. And so uh, PRNU is um, the, the non-uniform responsivity of the sensors across the, the, across the detector. Mm -hmm. And so that's a very important thing that we want to calibrate out because that non-sensitivity prints directly into the brightest parts of the image, not the, not the dimmest parts, but the brightest parts. And so those three things are very important to correct. And this is uh, an image out of my 14 inch. And you can see that's a normal pattern. You notice the edges are dark, but they're not really dark. And when everything works properly, you get a nicely calibrated image. This is a little dark, maybe on one side, but, but you can see it's mostly pretty flat. You may have some sky gradients in there or whatever, but, but it's getting rid of that, that uh, non-uniformity due to either vignetting or cosine to the fourth radiometric fall off, which by the way, every optical system has, that's not a vignetting effect, okay? Well, on, this, on the 20 inch, of course, I went in and I took some images and I built myself a nice flat panel. This is an EL 24 by 24 inch EL panel. And uh, I set it up to take, to take flats. And when I did the correction, uh-oh, I ended up with very bright corners. Hmm. Overcorrected, yeah. That is bad news. So, of course, I had to stop and scratch my head, and a lot of people come to me behind the scenes and ask about flat problems, and this is really common. And I tell, I, I have one uniform response that is, you know, flats only correct for multiplicative errors, okay? They don't correct for additive errors, and stray light are additive errors. And I say, I always tell them the very first thing you got to do is go look for additive errors, stray light. And so I had to take my own advice, which is really hard. It's easy to tell somebody else to go do this, but now I had to go take my own, my own advice. And so I had to go back and look at my system. And the best way to do this, and again, this is what I tell everybody, go look backwards through your system. So I set this up and I looked backwards through my system and you can see these edges and things here. This was all set up to make sure that I had the camera positioned in the right place. You have to be very careful when you look backwards to make sure you're looking from the correct position. And guess what I saw? I saw a big mess here. I saw light coming directly through from the light panel. I saw all kinds of reflections. This was a mess. And I thought, oh, there's the problem right there. And so I contacted, uh, plane wave. And I said, we got a problem. You know, this, this thing is not properly baffled. And I think by now they were getting a little tired of hearing from me because <laughs> I made a number of calls to them. Uh, well, they were very gracious and they said, you're right. We agreed the, the baffles, we've been meaning to redesign the baffles on that telescope forever. We've known they're no good. Well, they didn't say that. We've known that they're, you know, they might need updating maybe is the way they said it, uh -huh. but they were very good about it. And they immediately <laughs> said about redesigning their baffles. And this was the old baffle on the far left. And the next one over this big fat thing was the new primary baffle. I didn't photograph the secondary baffle. It had to change as well, but it doesn't look as different. They did a really nice job of 3, 3D printing this with internal glare stops, the whole thing. I got it all mounted up and I looked in, inside and guess what? Perfect. I mean, basically no more stray light. They, they nailed it. And so I was delighted. I said, okay, that's going to fix the problem. Well, unfortunately it didn't. And I didn't show you, I'm not showing you an intermediate step. I can show you the intermediate step by showing you that. <laughs> I still got this problem. Hmm. And I went, uh-oh, now what? 
So I had to go back and do some stray light analysis. And again, we don't have enough time for me to go through all the gory details of this. So I'm just going to wave my hands at this very quickly. But I had basically designed the on-axis guiding system that I use on this system to incorporate the same system I used on the C14. And when I had done the initial design and looked at the F6.8 beams from this 20 inch, I looked at it and I thought, I'm going to get some vignetting. It won't be too bad. Should be good. I'm an optical engineer, right? This is no problem. I'm just going to walk away. I'm going to order this and it's going to work fine. Well, even optical engineers screw it up sometimes, and I did. I just totally, just totally dropped it on this thing. And I missed one critical thing, which is when you look at this image over here on the left, or this analysis, this ray trace on the, on the, on the left, it ignores the extreme rays that go into the corners of the sensor. And if you look at the corners of the sensor, the vignetting is extreme. The vignetting isn't so bad up and down and left and right, but it's terrible in the corners. And so I had to go through and look at all the apertures in this full system. And I realized, oh my gosh, I've got a huge amount of vignetting. Now, the question that I was unable to answer, and this is, uh, uh, I've had long discussions with Gaston uh, Baudet at, uh, uh, at IFI. He and I are good friends and we have talked at length about this, is how much vignetting is too much vignetting? And I can't tell you guys that. I'd really like to do more research on this. And I'd like to know because this is a common problem. I'm not the only one who's ever done this. And so the question is, I can tell you, you know, how much is too much? I can tell you 50% is way too much. I can tell you that right now. Uh, if it's 5% or 3%, it's probably fine. Somewhere in between 50 and probably 10% is too much. But <clears throat> I don't know how much is too much. But I will say that I had probably 50% at least in these regions, and that was causing huge troubles. Gaston was very nice to me, shared with me his design, his proprietary design. And I, it took me some, some pacing the floor because I thought, oh my God, I'll never fit this in. I can't get a hole big enough in, his, in, in any of this. I'm really screwed here until one day I had a light bulb go off after thinking about this for about a day and a half. And I had a light bulb go off and I said, I don't need round holes. If I have square holes, it'll fix it. So I redesigned this part here and I, I put in square holes to allow all of these beam, the be complete beam to get through to the sensor. And so this new sensor that, or this new ONAG that I built with Gaston's help, I wanna emphasize Gaston was very nice to me to help me with this. So I designed a wide field uh, on axis guider for him. And he was very gracious and helped me to put this together to rebuild the parts. And together we built this new special product. And I'm still pushing him to actually uh, offer this as a product. And the, the, the on-axis guider is not a problem for him. It's really the adapters. It's mounting it to other telescopes is the tr trick. So he and I are still talking about that. And I hope other plane wave owners and other people who use large sensors with fast telescopes will get to benefit from this but it's, that's still a little ways off. On the telescope, this is what it looks like. Externally, it looks just like his normal product. That's the cool thing, is I was able to fit it in in such a way that it used all his standard parts without making the thing gigantic. So this was really a cool solution, and it allows all of the, the beams to get through. This is what the back of the 20-inch looks like. There is a rotator and a focuser here. It's a Gemini. And it's counterweighted against the main camera and filter wheels because this L500 mount that I'm using has no gears in it, which means it's very sensitive to radial balance of the telescope. So this thing has to be counterbalanced radially as well as across deck and across um, uh, the RA axis. So this thing balances on a pinpoint right, right along the optical axis of the system. And it's kind of cool. Um, so I'm actually, this is using the FLI 16803 that I originally had. I now have a QHY 600 on here. And again, in my technical talk, I go into great detail about why I switch camera. I'm not, cameras, I'm not going to do that here. But that's the system that's going to go. And guess what? When I tried it, there's a calibrated image now with the wide field uh, ONAG. Oh, yeah. There's the uncalibrated. And you can see that that amount of vignetting makes all the difference. And again, I'd love to have an actual optical analysis of this so that I could tell you exactly what's going on. 
this is actually kind of a tough problem. And I think if I can get the right software, we could do the analysis. So I'm kind of working in the back of my head. I've, I've got a way to maybe analyze this a little bit more aggressively, uh, but I just haven't gotten to it. Um, but that gives you an idea of how the system performs. Uh, I finally got a full image. I got an image of the day out of it. This was my M109. Uh, so that's how well the telescope actually works in, pro, in you know, at the end of the day. And you can see it's nice pinpoint stars. This is under about two arc seconds seeing. Uh, down in Chile, I, you know, I'm told it gets down to it's, you know, the median is around a half to three quarters of an arc second, and that it occasionally gets to a quarter arc second. I, it, that's just hard to believe it could be yeah. that good, but that's what they tell me. And I've had enough people tell me that, that I'm kind of starting to believe it, but I'll tell you, give me time using the telescope. I'll tell you whether that's right or not. I can tell right away by looking at guide stars and all kinds of stuff, how good it really is. Um, so that's, that's kind of the story, you know, the lessons for these remote telescopes is, you know, number one, nothing is easy and sending a telescope down to, down to Chile or even down to New Mexico without testing it is a really, it's a really bad idea to do without verifying the performance. So always verify the performance, you know, engineering in the real world is almost never linear. You know, I goofed on this thing. I, you know, I hate to admit it, but you know, that happens. And so, you know, bridges fall down <laughs> sometimes. There's, you know, engineers don't always get it right in spite of our best efforts. Uh, but, you know, figuring it out and getting it to work is, I was successful and I'm happy about that. But paying attention to the details, you know, this is where problems often hide out. You know, that whole thing with the little diffraction pattern. So many people saw that. Nobody thought about what it was. Murphy is relentless in screwing things up. You have to be very careful and cautious. And I predict when I get my telescope to Chile and it's 7,000 miles away, I will have a problem that I haven't yet seen. I predict that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes, you know, amateurs like to always try things and not analyze it. I never think that's a good idea. But sometimes it's, it's, uh, it, it's better to just try something than to overanalyze it. I mean, I'd still be scratching my head over that vignetting problem if I really wanted to analyze it to death. But, you know, I just said, if I get rid of the vignetting, it's got to work. And sure enough, it did. So, uh, you know, if you've got a billion dollar telescope and you've got a problem with it, you better analyze it before you build it. Uh, with this 20 inch telescope, there's some money involved, but it's not, you know, we're not talking billions of dollars. So just go try it. Um, and, you know, ultimately having good problem solving skills in astrophotography is absolutely important. You've got to measure things, analyze it, have some theory and a way to test the theory. And that's something I really emphasize when people come to me with some problem. And that's, you know, that's a very, very quick overview of this project that I have going down to Chile. So I hope I haven't spent taking too much of your time, but uh, if there are any questions about that, I can, we can probably do a quick Q and A if there are any questions. Well, there's just some general comments, uh, Dr. Hayes. Uh, Jeff Wise says you're fun to listen to and, and uh, very sharp. Um, we have a lot of uh, beginning astrophotographers on this program that are watching. Some of them have been experienced for a while, but uh, uh, you know, you were, you know, showing a system like this is uh, really showing kind of the. Uh, more or less the bleeding edge of, of what amateur astrophotography is all about. You're bringing, uh, you know, the full uh, force of your, um, uh, you know, professional experience. And, uh, you know, I expect you're going to get some amazing uh, work down in, down in Chile. Now, is this, is this site in Chile, is it north of CTIO? Is that, is that where it'll ultimately it's, live? Yeah, I, I'm not completely sure of where CTIO is. It's it's where the Chile scope is. It's at Obst, Obstec. It's about, I've looked at the map, and as I recall, it's about 50 miles or so to the south of where the Giant Magellan Telescope is being oh, okay. in the Atacama okay. Desert. So it's not right in the same place, but it's it's under that same weather pattern. And to to the to note for to encourage the, the beginners here. Uh, the very first astronomy meeting that I went to, or, or imaging meeting that I went to at Southwest uh, Swap uh, Astrophotography Conference in Tucson, you know, I was surrounded by guys. I was out, you know, just trying to figure out flats and how to guide with my 14-inch telescope. I was undaunted by 14-inch telescope. The four meters of telescope uh, focal length didn't bother me a bit, but. Uh, I was surrounded by guys who had remote telescopes. They were using CCDs and they were using all this sophisticated stuff. And I thought, 
holy smokes, this sounds com complicated. So you're not alone. You know, if you're starting and you're right. just trying to figure this stuff out. I mean, I went through that as well. So we all go through that. And I think it's just a matter of, of taking it one step at a time. You got to figure out how to guide. You got to figure out how to, mount, well, first you got to figure out how to mount your camera. And I, and I encounter so many people who don't know where to put their camera. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I could go on and on about that, but, but I'll just say, you got to figure out how to get your camera mounted. You got to figure out how to guide. And, you know, these little issues of like, well, what do I do? How do I take flats? I mean, I see that all the time. And do I really need to subtract darks? And, you know, you begin to fight through all that stuff. And then the concept of making it run automatically all night and park itself at the end of the okay. night, you know, that's an enormous step. But once you get to that step, you're only a small ways away from being able to put it remote, even though at the time you'll feel like, my God, I'll never get there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's just a matter of working through it one step at a time. Will you uh, install the telescope yourself down in Chile? Or well, you... that was always the plan. And, you know, it's, okay. I, I want to touch my own stuff. I want to install my own stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, if it gets, if it's going to get screwed up, I want to be the guy who screws it up. I don't want somebody else to screw it up. But with the pandemic and um, with the situation in Chile with the pandemic right now and traveling all the way down there, Mm -hmm. I've resigned myself to the fact that I'm going to have to pack it up and ship it to the guys at Obstech. They really know what they're doing. They've installed a lot of these. My scope is far more plug and play than I probably almost any of the scopes that have been down there. Certainly there's none that are going to be easier to install than mine uh, cool. because I've made it just, I mean, literally when I roll it out, I just plug it into that electronics box. There's just connectors. Every night I plug it in, plug, unplug it. So uh, as long as we can keep the wiring from getting all tangled up, and that should be easy, uh, they can just set this up, polar align it, plug it in, and it should go. So, yes. yeah. So now hopefully I'll go down there at some point. Oh, of course. Of course. You mentioned that uh, you've had mice like chewing through, oh. um, uh, you know, uh, electrical cables and stuff like that. I was advising somebody just earlier today about that. You know, the it was an astronomy club up in uh, St. Louis, and they had installed this uh, observatory and this telescope. And, you know, they made, you know, they made a good installation, um, but uh, they had not thought of the idea that, uh, you know, little critters can get in there and start to gnaw away at things. I noticed that when I was at CTIO that uh, they ran all their cabling under the ground and they had like grids you know, the, this grid work that uh, metal uh, grids that uh, kept animals out, you know, so I was, uh, I was impressed by that. Um, so it turns out that they're making a lot of cables, particularly, well, USB and power cables out of a reprocessed soy um, uh, material. And mice love that soy material. Oh, and so they won't eat rubber, but they will eat the soy based um, cladding. And no um, mice will also get into the smallest holes on your mount and they will build nests inside your mount. I had to clean it and they chewed up the inside of my wiring on my, my Astrophysics 1600. Fortunately, they didn't go through the actual connectors. I had to go in and reseal everything. Um, so if you, you know, my scope now has been running out there for years and years without a problem. But initially when I put it in, uh, I went out with Bruce, one of the guys at the, the site, uh, the owner of the site, and we cleaned mice out of, I think it was two or three telescopes, including mine. And, um, and, and then they chewed through the, the cables later on. And it's just, it's so frustrating. You know, I've got to travel a thousand miles to go down. Oh, to fix yeah. It. It's a huge hassle. It's a, huge it's a big hassle. hassle. Fortunately, I'm a pilot and I can fly down there. So it's not, you know, it's kind of an adventure for me to go down there, but it's a sure. big deal. I mean, it's it's a two or three day adventure to get down there and fix stuff. Right. Well, that's fantastic. Well, um, well while you're uh, speaking, have, sorry, I just have to ahead. say ahead, this image of the uh, Crescent Nebula. I, I'm I'm just drinking it in. Uh, you know, <laughs> looking at every. You know, I've never seen one. This is the best image I've ever seen of this object well I mean, thank you cameron uh, this is one of my favorite images that i've taken and i've awesome. taken some that i like as much as this one but this is one of my favorite images you, you know i mean I, i'm just looking at stuff that you know i've never seen before like this outer shell right kind of the shock wave um, on the outside and then and then even in the middle there it looks like there's a dark nebula that's called the bullet 
That's called the bullet. bullet. Yeah, yeah. I never seen that before. That's cool. Yeah. All right. That's really neat. Just love it. This anyhow, Thank it's you. gorgeous. Thank nice you. Fun. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, we loved it all. We loved it all, Mr. Hayes. And we are we are so grateful. The whole uh ast astronomy community, the astrophotography community is grateful for all the work you did. I think when you put it all together, all of that effort, um, it, it's really it's patience. And uh, that's that's what all astrophotographers need because yeah, it's getting something to work, it's testing, it's trying, and it is really uh, it's all about that patience. And well, it's I'll add something, Ross. Photo. You're absolutely right. I agree with you 100. percent But it's patience plus perseverance. If you don't have those two characteristics, you're not going to get very far in astrophotography. And it's frustrating because you want to have it done right now. <laughs> so, you know, when I unpacked this thing, it was, gosh, almost not quite, it's maybe 18, 19 months. I haven't added it up. You know, 18 months ago, this thing came out of the crates. And I can't tell you how many times I thought, oh, now what? <laughs> and any time you run into a problem, it's not that you have it solved tomorrow, it's like six to eight weeks before you get it solved. I mean, I've compressed a lot in this story, you know? Yes. <laughs> I, oh, yes. Hmm. Well, we certainly, uh, we certainly appreciate it. We will sign you out with, um, with the video that you have, um, that, that you made, I found online, and consequently, it is called Looking Up. And well, so thank you, guys. I'm going to try to find it here for you. For you, John, when uh, when you're ready, you can you can stop sharing, and I will. Uh, oh, we'll okay. Aim, and um, I'll share the the video. Might not be able to get the whole thing, but here it is. So, looking up, uh, I think it goes great with our show. So we'll leave you with uh, some relaxing images that uh, Mr. Mr. John B. Hayes worked so hard to give to all of us. Wow. Looks like Hubble images. They do. Look at that. Beautiful bubble nebula. Yeah. The hamburger it's one galaxy. of my favorite galaxies. It really Love is. Love this one, yeah. One of the triplets. Yeah. Wow. My favorite, <laughs> if you haven't noticed. <laughs> yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. I can't wait until I can image the horse that I, I, I still haven't seen it. The triffid. Beautiful. Well, this is the nice. Yeah, excellent. Wow. I, yeah, I love the the red that you got in there. I've, yeah. I have never wow. been able to get it. Look at that. Well, this is a spaghetti. Oh, no. Yeah, the jellyfish. Unreal. Unreal. Looks like yeah. spaghetti. Yeah. Look at that. All those tendrils. No way. Yeah, I only see the inner core of that. That's amazing. Look at how huge it is. I heard M106 being called the Splendid Galaxy. It is yeah. splendid, but. Yeah, one of my favorite. Yeah, M78, it's incredible. Wow. Oh, look at that. You can see the other side. Now you can see the, the ejection of the, all the stars. Look at all the H2 regions there. Amazing. That's oh. unrecognizable. Look at that. This is like infrared. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's. Uh, that is amazing. Oh, nice. Yeah. Cocoon. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Very nice. Look at how rich it is inside. Yeah. That's great. I love on these these ones here, uh, the pelican and that, where you have the and the elephant trunk, how you have the wave. The wow, edge look the at that. Oh, look at that. That's so beautiful. Really see the core. A little bit texture. Oh man, of course. Yes. Yeah, he's got the pillars of creation himself. That's great. Nice resolution. 
Yeah, the excellent scene. The Perseus molecular cloud. Wow. wow. You know, our next global star party is about stardust. And, uh, and of course, uh, I mean, these, a lot of these images here are wow. would be very appropriate for that. Okay, that. I love the tadpoles. I love the yeah. tadpoles. The technique you use, John, it really looks like you're doing a, the exposures. You're doing a lot of different types of stack, uh, like like different filters and also different. Well, I've got techniques. both RG. Or there's RGB imaging here. This happens to be narrow band. That was about a hundred hours of exposure on that. Oh yeah, uh, on the soap bubble. Look, wow, and so that's narrow star. band. That's RGB. So there's different color palettes being used depending on the type of imaging. Yes. What is the deepest uh, image? that you've made? Oh, probably the soap bubble. The soap okay. bubble was, I mean, again, that was that's hours. extraordinarily faint. I, I wouldn't say that's the most difficult to process. There's my old C14 back when I used mm -hmm. to use it nice here. Set up. Very oh. nice. um, it never gets old though. It's old, but, but it never uh, gets old. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, probably the soap bubble. But I, you know, I've wondered how, how deep, how, what magnitude I've reached and what's the furthest galaxy that I've imaged. Yeah, yeah. So that would be neat to figure out. And I'm sure it's, you know, well over a billion light years, but it's, I haven't actually researched that to see. Hmm. Wow. Right. Beautiful. We, we yeah. couldn't be more grateful uh, for you, John. So, uh, well, it's my pleasure. Your next images. Yeah. I got another one that's coming up. All right. <laughs> All right follow him on, on Astrobin. Everybody follow him on, on Astrobin. Yeah, and that video as well, right? It's on. Uh, that on, uh, uh, that was on YouTube. That's on YouTube. Yep, excellent. Yeah, yeah. And now, uh, now it's time for in the show where we uh, we go deep with Cameron Gillis, and we we're already pretty deep. I I think um, we have flown over most people's heads, certainly mine. Um, but so thank you for that, John. It is uh, it's incredible. It, it's certainly incredible. So Cameron, I know you've got some uh, some new gear. And I know Mr. Hayes likes the gear too. That's uh, you know, that's really what uh, what got him into the optics was uh, was loving the gear. So Cameron, tell us about some cool gear you've been playing with. All right, thanks a lot. Okay, well, uh, let me just start off with uh, just kind of a, a segue into kind of the updates for this week. Is um, you know, the darks and flats and the calibration frames. Just a little bit uh, about my primitive um, way of kind of doing that is, is I took uh, my, my white screen for flats. Let me just put this in presentation mode here. I started out off, uh, this is a little bit of um, preview or review from uh, earlier, but I started off with this, just, just putting a towel for a uh, pillowcase over my C8 and just taking some uh, flats that way, but that didn't work out too well. So I found out I actually have a 27 inch uh, flat screen monitor and I was able to uh, adjust the brightness on that and, and just do a present PowerPoint presentation with a white screen. And, uh, and then that works beautifully because I can adjust the exposure time and also the, uh, the uh, brightness in, in very fine increments. And that gets my, uh, my di distribution in my flat uh, just where I want it. So uh, I can adjust the, um, the distribution here based on, on that. And you can see it takes a really good quality flat. And the result of that is, uh, I'll show you a couple of pictures where, where you can see the before and after. So here's, here's um, you know, M17 Omega uh, when I first uh, took it, heavy big netting, um, you know, very, very bad. But then once I uh, used the, uh, the flat, you can see it really uh, took care of all that beautifully. So I'm very happy with that. And then um, continuing on, there's two others I want to show you. The uh, Lagoon Nebula. So this is before, again, very strong vignetting. Um, but then, of course, all eliminated with, with the flats. with the, And then finally, the Lagoon Nebula. So that's where that was a Trifid Nebula. Now the Lagoon Nebula, again, you can see the... And what I, what, I, what I noticed, John, uh, and, and everyone, uh, one of the biggest benefits when I go to 
of, of getting flats is it changes your uh, signal to noise distribution. So what happens is you're, you really get, when you're doing your, you're adjusting your curves and you're, you're doing your light balance, you have your nebulosity it, it comes out much more, a much better contrast because you're maintaining a better, more even signal to noise across the entire uh, frame. Instead of having That's a picture, Cameron. No, yeah, just... you know, if here you have very blown out. So you know, if you shift to make uh, the center dark, then you're going to lose all the nebulosity on the outside. And on the flip side, if you blow out the uh, the outside, then the inside is going to be totally blown out. So you're you're oversaturating. So what, by by putting flats, uh, you you really you take care of all that, and you have a much better. These are not awesome pictures, but, but it is showing you the basics of techniques, kind of entry level and uh, using the same principle. Now, obviously what John was showing is much more advanced because, you know, I, I'm gonna have big netting because of my uh, sensor size as well, probably being cut off by a circular, um, uh, you know, baffle. But, uh, you know, the, the, right now for my purposes, uh, this this works out pretty good. Um, and uh, And basically, so now what I wanted to share this week, though, is I don't have, so this is just a reminder. This is my, uh, oh, this is not my setup. Uh, let me go to, that was my earlier setup. If I think I go to this one here. Yeah, here we go. So this is my current setup uh, on, on a Exus 2 uh, equatorial mount. And uh, this is, of course, with the optical, and of course, I, I have added the imager. So if I combine, this is my image train that I've stuck on the back of that. And what I've done is, and what I've been doing, uh, we've, we've, I'm in the Pacific Northwest uh, as well, John. I'm um, in Seattle area. So the rains have returned and uh, the storms are back. So uh, I haven't got any, uh, any more imaging uh, in. So I've been focusing on my, on getting my, Moving from alpha azimuth, this uh, this system to my new equatorial mount, my PMC8 uh, with uh, XS2, and uh, what I've what I'm trying to do is minimize the cabling, making it simple, making sure I have a good workflow because I got a really good workflow with this setup on alpha azimuth, but now. Um, we uh, on on this setup. I want to make sure I have the same type of uh, efficient workflow and taking advantage of the equatorial the benefits of the equatorial mount to be able to look, uh, for example, at zenith and, uh, and 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 all the objects that are directly overhead with the uh, the smallest atmospheric uh, disturbance and, and minimum uh, light pollution. So, with that all said, can, can um, I ask you a what question, I, Cameron? Yeah, go for it. Yes. Yeah, so, so what do you do with that telescope that's attached to the top of your main imaging scope? So what I, I just put it in there uh, for now, mainly to help me uh, optically so that I can, I can uh, uh, well, two, two things. Um, visually, as you see it here, I, I, I just wanted to have both be able to look through both telescopes simultaneously and switch between and have multiple uh, powers uh, and and apertures to be able to compare the uh, you know do side literally side by side comparison as I'm looking at different objects to be able so, to kind of understand that that was the so, first thing so yes. visually that won't hurt you at all but for imaging that's going to hurt you a lot because of the vibrations right yeah so what you're doing by doing that is that will have a significant impact on the mechanical resonance of the system and you're lowering the mechanical resonance of your system by doing that and um, that can be a big source of mechanical vibration and how fast your system damps. And so yeah. keeping your center of mass as low as possible um, and moving those counterweights as high as you can on the shaft, even if you have to add more of them, uh, you, will, you will do two things. You will, you will increase the, the resonant frequency of the system, which will make it damp faster and it'll make it less susceptible to vibration. And second, it'll be easier on your motors for guiding. Yes, because the, the, there's a torque uh, aspect. Yeah, the um, moment of inertia, the rotational moment of inertia gets really big because it goes as the square of the, of the moment arm 
to your right weights like a, like a long you. refractor for example yeah. would have that issue. so again you know yeah. for visual you might notice it when you tap the system i don't know how much it moves around when you tap the system at high power ideally yes. what you want to do is tap it at high power on my four c14 i can tap it pretty hard and i don't see it move at all that's awesome <laughs> now, that is a completely different system than what you're running but that's your goal that's your yes. goal you want to see it damp as fast as you possibly can when you are imaging so i just want to caution you that having that stuff stacked up on there is not good for imaging that is good thanks john i, I really appreciate because the other thing as as you know is we get uh, it starts to get a little gusty sometimes even on clear nights as we go and so uh, the wind uh, causes uh, some issues as well uh, so that causes some vibration so i have about and that'll second. help that helps yeah. your cross section to the wind and it helps with damping for the wind if the, if there's a little gust it helps to damp, it helps to make the oscillation smaller and damp yeah. faster that's really good because you know what that that's uh, the main reason I mean, uh, I, the reason why I put it in line like this and uh, you know it, it sticks out is because I was thinking of about the uh, kind of uh, balance, right? I was thinking about the balance so it keeps the same balance. but uh, but I like what you're saying. So when I start to go into imaging, especially uh, yeah, I, I'll take that off uh, for for those cases. that's that's really cool. Good advice. thanks. I love it. Um, and, and speaking of which, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm just was doing this visually initially, and then it was helping me, um, with my imaging a little bit to get, to kind of orientate, because this is a little bit wider field of view. So I would be able to, um, use that to be able to, and, and then I would use my imager, uh, to be able to, uh, you know, do my, my polar alignment and all that type of stuff. So, um. And then, and of course, uh, center on and do my visual plate solving or my my uh, plate solving from the uh, from the image captures. So it was it's it's this is a temporary thing. And and now that you mentioned it, when I start to get my workflow, I'm going to take that off to eliminate those uh, uh, you know that that that, that uh, stress on that. That's a good. That's a really take good as thing. much off on that side of the scope as you can, including the bar, the crossbar on the top. Okay, yeah, because this already adds a couple pounds. No, you're right. You're right. Yeah, take everything um, off of there. Cool. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. So, um, so what I'm, what I, what I was, what I've done in the last week, as I plugged this on last week, I showed you uh, the the um, uh, the drift alignment uh, with with Scott and Scott's uh, help. Oh, by um, the way, I just want to tell our passengers and, and you. And you first mate Gillis. I did the drift alignment in PHP two. Uh, I don't know if I've ever had so much fun. It was really, really cool. So I encourage everybody to try it. Uh, it's awesome. great, and it didn't take that long at all. No, it's not bad, and it's very. It gives you really good feedback, and you really, you you start to understand what's going on. It really helps you internalize exactly what you're doing, how you're adjusting the altitude and azimuth uh, knobs on your polar alignment and the effect that has and, and then you know and ultimately just make the overall experience uh, really good so i think that's yeah it's really cool so speaking of which um you know what what i'm doing now is it's like okay uh i want to start to get like i said to the same workflow here where i had one tablet connected uh with sky safari the other tablet connected to asi air pro and to be able to uh do my imaging and so I would navigate with one tablet and then uh, and do the imaging with the other. And after a lot of research, I was trying to figure out, okay, how do I, how do I, what's the best way to connect um, to the, to the PMC8 and also my imager and all that. And I found out that there was a, there's a really good video from Peter Zelinka. I don't know if you've, you, you know that name, but if I share my screen here, uh, he had he had a really good not this one no that was uh, Kevin Lagore <laughs> um, yeah here we go so from um, it it was actually about the EQ six uh, R with ASR Pro uh, workflow and um, but in the middle of the video he starts talking about um, um, actually how to how to connect the mount uh, to to uh, uh, both this uh, to the ASI Air Pro. 
And the advantage of that is I can actually, uh, if I go back to my presentation, uh, the advantage of that is then I eliminate, what I do is I connect the PMC8, I'm oh, sorry, uh, the PMC8 to the ASI Air Pro directly uh, with a USB um, cable and, and the, uh, and the uh, DB9 serial port. And the advantage of that is now I, always, I have a permanent physical connection to the, uh, between the, the ASI Air Pro and the, the PMC-8. So it will always stay uh, tracking. And because if, if you use the wireless uh, tablet, uh, what, what happens is if you lose connection or on Android, if you change programs, it will actually disconnect during that time, and you're going to start to lose your 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 connection. Um, the other advantage of that is I can connect now to the ASI Air Pro, um, and 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 only connect to that uh, uh, Wi-Fi. And basically, now I don't have multiple uh, Wi-Fi's, and basically I can just go to that and then control the mount the mount through uh, the ASI Air Pro app. Now. What you do is you connect. There's a there, there's a special cable. Um, let me just. Uh, there was another. Where is it here? Not this one. Get this out of the way. Give me a second. The ASI Air works works well with that uh, XS2 PMC8. Yeah, and and then on the, and then on cloudy nights or not a cloudy nights. I I, re I went uh, to, uh, to con how do you connect the ASI Air to um, to the Exos two to the PMCA? Um, so I went to um, Groups.io, the uh, the um, our our website, right? The uh, Explore Scientific um, uh, Open Go to Forum, and uh, in the Open Go to Forum, there's this one uh, Marco Pula created a uh, a guide on how to connect the Exos two. Mm -hmm. the PMC-8. And this is a really good document because what it does is it tells you uh, how to basically uh, get this serial port, serial to USB port uh, um, cable. You need a special type of cable. It's called an F uh, FTDI chipset uh, cable. And that basically takes, you plug that, when you plug that into your computer, you're, uh, or you basically creates a COM port. Uh, to a to a, nor a normal like an older or older style uh, DB9 COM port, and uh, in my computer's case, um, when I loaded the FTDI uh, drivers for this cable, it basically made a COM3. And once you have that, you can plug this into your PMC8, and then plug in the USB into the ASI Air Pro into one of, its, one of its USB 2 ports. And then you basically, you can control the scope and everything through ASI Air, and, uh, and which, which, which is very helpful because it also has a polar alignment uh, routine that, that basically uh, does uh, visual place solving. It takes some images and I'm gonna get into that later, but there's a lot of advantages in doing that. So as you can tell in the way I'm, uh, you know, putting this together, it's not really fully prepared because I'm, this is really work in progress. So, uh, but the end goal here is to, like they say, get it so that I can have minimum cables, uh, minimum Wi-Fi connection, right? And, and stable, keep the PMC-8 going through my ASI Air, um, and then basically uh, uh, control everything. And then ultimately also use a Sky Safari to be able to uh, to be able to have the same workflow as I had before for my imaging. Um, well, Cameron, so, is there a way? Are you on the um, Are you on the YouTube? Is there a way you can share a link uh, to that screen? I know we're coming up on a hard stop pretty soon, and I've got I've got a good story time. We've got yeah yeah yeah. Let me uh, yeah. So so, but so, I know everybody wants that because uh, in customer service, I get calls about it a lot. And uh, I, I want it too. So thank, thank you for sharing that. It's going to be a tremendous. Yeah, and it, again, the story is kind of half baked here. Um, as you can see, I was kind of, you know, it wasn't fully prepared. But 
that's the whole part of the fun here. Uh, because yeah. guess what? I'm, I'm going to, as you can see, you know, in, in the uh, drift alignment uh, session from last week uh, and all my other sessions, once I get this to a certain point, when I have enough rainy nights, I'm going to be able to make a really nice uh, little tutorial on how I all got this working with uh, ASI Air uh, and, and everything. So, uh, I mean, That's let me true. share the link. Let me share the link. Yeah, sure, okay. yeah share that I'll, link. I'll, I'll uh, share the link in the, in the chat here. This is okay, this is I'll, this, I'll this, this is the group. Yeah, this is the groups.io. Uh, that's that PDF for how to get the serial port connection to the uh, Exos two, uh, and you want to buy that cable. It's about ten to fifteen bucks. It's not it's not much, uh, but it it's going to be really helpful for you. And then uh, and then after you get that from Amazon, uh, the the another really good link that I want to share with you briefly here is this one here yeah so this is peter zelinka he's a really good I've guy had another meeting i'm gonna oh thank you much bye bye yes thanks bye. John. Yep, yeah 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 thanks Take again yeah thank you so much yeah nice meeting all right so and this this is peter zelinka's uh a youtube video which shows you how to um connect the sir to your go to your mount and um that's one of the things that we we still need to do, um, Scott, as you know, and, and this is something for, for Jerry, mm -hmm. is um, nat natively, uh, Sky Safari only supports the Mead and Celestron uh, right. protocol. That's right. And so so we, we, wanna, we wanna be able to do something, and I'm gonna figure out how to do that with, um, with ASCOM, because I guess there's a way of using ASCOM to be able to kind of create that bridge. But uh, to be continued, anyhow. Be continued. The point is, I'm taking advantage of these these cloudy nights, and uh, we will get there, and it will be a lot cleaner, and then everyone can enjoy the fruits of our labor here and make a really nice workflow. That's right. Well, yeah. Thank Thank you, first mate Gillis. Um, you know, you you really bring it bring it together and give our guests what they really are looking for. Um, you know how how to do it, how to get in the game. That ASI Air Pro it works great with our Exos 2 PMC8. We've got the PMC8 in stock. We're ready to get them out to you. We've got the G8 or the G11s in stock. Uh, I mean, things are coming in. The, uh, the stuff is coming off the off the boats, and so we are super happy about that. Another thing uh, we couldn't be more excited about on the mothership is we are getting in a lot. More passengers because we've got Vixen now and Vixen's coming up. Uh, we have we are going to be carrying those Vixen products soon. So that VSD 100 millimeter uh, F 3.8. Um, it's hopefully pretty soon. I'm going to have it back here and uh, be taking pictures with it too. But what I can uh, tell our passengers is last week, um, you know, I did I did see uh, the mothership's final destination, and I I just cannot talk about that anymore because it stresses me out too much. <laughs> but uh, I got to talk to the venerable Mr. Mart. He's provided so many stories uh, for me and and for the show, and and we talked about youth baseball, and I've got a really good story, um, but it had to wait. Um, so many other things came up. I got a call from Rainwater Observatory. And they are a great observatory down in Mississippi. I want to share their website for you guys real quick. It's going to be our shout out uh, for, for today. It's the Rainwater Observatory. It's a huge observatory. They have tons of telescopes. But what they don't have much of, guys, passengers, is they don't have very many eyepieces. So if anybody on board, they start taking more photos, you think, well, you know, I haven't looked through this eyepiece in, in months, maybe even a year. Well, they've got some kids down there that would love to look through those eyepieces. So check out Rainwater Observatory. They've got a beautiful website. They've got a beautiful website. And let's see if I can figure out how to share something else now. Uh, we'll stop sharing that one. Um, and I just got to share and stop sharing because I really don't know uh, the way all this stuff works. Um, but last night, last night I was thinking, you know, we have this great show and, and everybody thinks, uh, you know, they start to get intimidated. We get John Hayes on and he's saying, you know, yeah, my equipment tested, tested stuff for the, uh, 
James Webb Space Telescope and like, oh man, I could never do this. It's so expensive. Or, you know, how do I get in the game? Well, go to explorescientific.com. Right now we've got this telescope. It is, I don't, I don't think we make any money off of it because it's so cheap. It's $389 with the mount included. Uh, 1,000 millimeter focal length, uh, four inch telescope, beautiful, beautiful refractor. And uh, so let me just show you, let me just show you here last night, the moon was out and uh, that's, that's the picture I took of it. We've already got it up on our website. Um, a beautiful mm -hmm. shot of the moon. I'll try to zoom in. I mean, it, it might, oh, be, nice my, work. might be my nice best work. picture nice of the moon. And, beautiful. Uh, you know, so you don't need the most expensive stuff. Um, you know, we so that that does lead me to we're going to we're going to have a next three part series coming up. Um, just, you know, how to really get in that game. I might even go to a pawn shop and get a, a, get a cheap little DSLR, film the whole thing and strap it to a telescope uh, or just. Uh, yeah, there's, you know, there's there's a guy named um, probably a lot of the people are watching this show. Watch this guy as well. Uh, I think his uh, moniker is Astro Biscuit. And he's out of, uh, I think he's out of the UK. And um, he built a system on buying used parts. I think it was like $500 he spent. I think that was his limit, you know, including the camera, including everything. Okay. And then he compared it against a system that was like, I don't know, $10,000. Right. And I'll be honest, it was really hard to see the, you know, the $9,500 spread in the quality of these images, okay? Uh, he did really an amazing job. And, um, uh, you know, guys like him, uh, Caesar down in, uh, in Argentina, uh, Maxi down in Argentina, Nico, Nico's using a Dobsonian to do this, okay? He doesn't even have drives, no computers, except for the computer running his camera, <laughs> you know? So, I mean, it's really amazing. And so there is no excuse not to get involved in astrophotography if you want to do it. So, you know, Oh yeah. And, that, and, that, that was jump in. and John yeah. Hayes said something I have heard many astrophotographers say and astronomers say is just start doing it. Okay. Just, just try it and see what happens. So. What did you take? Uh, what did you use to take that picture, Russ? At, uh, I used, um, I used the ATIC horizon. Um, a color camera. So, I mean, essentially a, a sensor from a DSLR camera, but, but like, like the captain said, there is no excuse. Get out there and start doing it because you might be just like our, uh, our great passenger who we are so proud of from Brazil, Jose Luis Pereira, uh, the amateur astronomer who captured an enormous object just a few days ago, crashing into Jupiter. Jupiter is our great defender, so thank you, Jupiter, for taking the hit for us. But again, he, he captured this with a QHY5 III 462C, and uh, that's a $300 camera. So let's watch a little video of, uh, of Mr. Hole Jose Luis Perez. Oh, wow. Look at that. Oh, that's awesome. Just, just a couple days ago. <laughs> All right. And oh, fantastic. Yeah. Oh, so, awesome. yeah, we can watch it over and over again for the next 54 seconds if we'd like. Um, but, you know, of all of all the incredible things that that occurred this week, I would have to say the most incredible thing for me and my family was that uh, my wife uh, became a citizen of the United States today. Oh, her, congratulations. congratulations. Yeah. So the the queen of the South. Uh, it was nine years ago while walking across the Patagonian desert, a little further south than the Atacama Desert. I was in search of the mothership and I was wearing this exact shirt that I have on now. And I was lucky enough to meet this lady. Uh, you might know the uh, Patagonia Clothing Company. Well, they've yeah. got a mountain uh, as their logo. And right under that mountain, that's where I met my future wife. Um, and so yesterday, this Patagonian princess, she became a citizen of the North. And so now, you know, at least in our household, uh, all the way from the Northwest Territory in Alaska down to the Bridges House on the Fuegian coast, 
There is only one America. And so let me read a little paragraph from a little known uh, fairy tale. And all these chapters here, they started with, uh, with some quotes. So here's a quote from uh, this chapter that we'll read the very beginning and the very end. And it goes up. Uh, it's by Richard P. Feynman. You might know him. Uh, the smart people might. He says, uh, poets say science take away from the beauty of the stars. Mere globs of gas atoms. I, too, can see the stars on a desert night and feel them. But do I see less or more? And that is a good question. That is a good question. Um, you know, one probably only the explorer scientist can answer. Because, you know, after I had met that Patagonian princess, I had to keep going. I had to keep walking. And I was laying down there in the middle of the desert all by myself. And the stars were coming out individually in the dry, clear air. air. The Milky Way makes a line so alive with light. The Southern Cross is the most recognizable constellation in the sky and was the place my eyes rested each night. The constellations here are unseen in the Northern Hemisphere, no matter how dark the night. Billion-year-old photons were captured for the first time by my lens. My meditative stare shifted focus only when a passing satellite went through the sky. A shooting star. I kept whispering aloud, only to realize it was moving much too slowly. So that's a little tale of uh, how I met my wife. And I will end the show with something incredible here. Uh, we've got our source code creator, Jerry Hubble. He is running the algorithms right now as we speak to try to figure out the likelihood of this. Where did it go? Uh, being a coincidence and maybe. Let's see here. Hold on, let me, I might have to go back and find it because this is too good. Um, we'll just share this for now and then I will go find that other thing I'd like to share. I don't know why it's not. So let's stop sharing here. I apologize. I, you know, something always goes wrong when the sailmaker comes out, but uh, where is that thing? It's not letting me share this video. <laughs> and we're getting we're getting close to where we have to uh, yeah. end the show, Ross. Unfortunately, I know. I we know. We have the astronomical right. league guys coming on. So well, all right, David. I don't know. You all probably can't see this video. I'm watching it now, but uh, no, I just want to say thanks, NASA, for watching the show. Thank you all for watching the show. I've got a video and. Uh, you know, maybe maybe it was just a coincidence. They uh, NASA Instagram, but uh, you know, Very I don't. Cool. I cool. don't think so. so, guys. Thank you so much. We got a great show coming next week, and uh, it'll be tough to beat this one. But so, th thanks for thanks to John Hayes and everybody else on board. Uh, we yeah. certainly had a phenomenal time. Yeah, and next week I'll I'll be able to share my live setup. I, I just don't have access to it right now, but. Uh... But I will share with you, and, and then we'll, we'll walk through the ASI connection, the FTDI stuff, and, and all that good stuff. Uh, it, it, it's uh, it's actually very straightforward, and I'll be more organized. So, thanks. You're fine. Excellent. Okay. All right. Hello, everybody. <laughs> hey. Hey, David. David. <laughs> good to see you. All right. So we are we're going to bring this show to a close, and. Um, uh, we'll be back in a few more minutes with the uh, Astronomical League Live program with uh, Claude Plymate. Um, if you don't know Claude, uh, he's been a uh, solar astronomer for many years. Uh, he retired from uh, Big Bear Solar Observatory, I think it was just last year. And now he is with uh, a group doing adaptive optics for telescopes. And that will be the subject of his talk. So. Um, We'll be back in a few minutes as we get this next show propped up here. So uh, hang in there. Oh, here we go. Hi, Cameron. Hey, David. Good to see you. How are you doing yeah, this Friday? I'm Oh, I'm doing fine. I wanted to tell you that I'm going to send you a copy of my next uh, 
Skyward uh, column. Oh, beautiful. Thank you. I, the I, reason that I'm going to do it is that you really inspired me a few weeks ago. Can you hear me at all? I can hear you. Maybe maybe we should just let this finish up because then I think Scott's gonna turn it off and back on again, and then we can uh, yeah, just give it give it a minute. Yeah.